I'm going to invite um, Minister Utan Cha uh, to give us some opening remarks about his views on how uh, Myanmar is moving from uh, alignment in one direction, one relationship that has driven the foreign policy of this country towards what I call multi-alignment, uh, looking in all directions. How will you be balancing uh, the, the complexity of diplomacy moving forward? Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mr. Cannon. Um, first, let me express that I'm very pleased that to be here with you all, and um, I'm very glad that uh, I have a chance to brief on at, at the first stage uh, on, uh, on Myanmar uh, changes. So talking about Myanmar these days is uh, very encouraging and very delightful. We know that Myanmar has been in limelight for the last three, three years in a different uh, picture. I'm sure that you all will know that last uh, 40 years plus, the picture that um, happening in Myanmar is totally different from last three years. There's a changes, there's a total changes from what is happening last 40 years. So last 40 years, we were under pressure. You know, we, are, we, are, we don't need to hide, you know, and everyone knows that. We have a difficulty dealing with the many countries. We have uh, a countries that they try to understand us. So before uh, going through, I would like to um, just uh, touch on our foreign policy. Nyama wanted to be, you know, our policy is that we want to be friends with all countries in the world. This is a uh, set policy since we got uh, independent. But we make clear that we have a neighboring country. They are big and they are try to understand our domestic development. So in our foreign policy, there is a, 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 we, we set up a good relation with the every countries, but we want to be more closer relation with our neighboring countries and in our region. This is a set foreign policy, you know, and this is the essence. So last 40 years, you all know, we had a, a military government. There is no sympathy for us, and Myanmar has a quite, um, you know, we survive, but we are lack of development. We s there is no such kind of starvation in our country, but there is no development that we miss. We are in the ASEAN country, but ASEAN tried to help approach, the ASEAN uh, uh, constructive approach to us. It works. It's, Myanmar has been, you know, a, a kind of coming out, a step that we can build it. We are in the group. We are with the, uh, as you know, there is a, a, a pressure, as I explained to you, we have a pressure from the the Western countries, as well as in the UN. UN-related issues, UN resolutions being adopted to us, which is 
a very difficult position that we have to counter. So these days, we have a, a good cooperation or you know, coordination with many countries in the East. Frankly admit, China has been helping a lot. ASEAN is giving a lot of support to us. India try to understand it. These are the countries that they know what is really happening in Myanmar and what we are you know, facing difficulties. So we have to thank the, uh, the countries that try to support us for the last 40 years. So now, you know, we have uh, 2011, we come in, in, the, in, the, in with the new government. We have a constitution. We have no constitution for the last 40 years. So we have constitution adopted. We have a, a kind of um, um, democratic government. We have an election. And we are moving in a new phase, which not only ASEAN countries are happy, the world and international community is very pleased of what is happening in Myanmar. So nowadays, Myanmar has Myanmar is working with not only close countries, but we are dealing with the very distant countries. The president has been visited Europe. The president has been visited to US very recently. And we have a lot of uh, visitors. Foreign ministry has been, you know, in a, in a, in a difficult position. We didn't enlarge our, our ministry. We have the staff that we were working last 40 years. So these days, Myanmar is looking forward to work with the international community. We are having, we know we have to do a lot, you know. We were out of touch for many years. We need to bring human resource, we need to bring the uh, information. We need to bring to follow you know, our ASEAN colleagues. We don't want to be left behind. We want mm -hmm. to go along with the ASEAN friends, mm -hmm. as well as the neighbors, two neighbors, that they are big, they are growing, and they are, you know, the, they have been calling us uh, Asian century, which this is too far to, 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 to understand at this moment. Mm -hmm. But whatever it is, we are happy with what is happening in Asia, and we are looking forward of you know, the progress is happening in Asia. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for sharing those thoughts. It is clear that Myanmar now has many more friends uh, than before, and, and they will not leave you behind. So I think at least you've reached that next level. And one of your, your new friends, <coughs> one of uh, Myanmar's best friends, is, is of course, Japan. Uh, which you mentioned. And uh, Japan has actually been a leading investor in the region. Perhaps one could say Japan deserves uh, an enormous amount of credit for being an invest in investment driver, a partner, a development partner in building this Asian century that we're talking about today. So we have with us Mr. Nishimura from the uh, Japanese cabinet. I'd love for you to comment not only on the partnership uh, with Myanmar and your investment in Myanmar uh, as a new sort of front in a way in your relations uh, with ASEAN, but also of course, as we talk about the Asian century, your relationship uh, with the United States and the Trans-Pacific Partnership. A lot of people are wondering if there's a tension between Japan's role as an ally of the United States and a key partner in the Trans-Pacific Partnership uh, framework versus its role in investing in this Asian century. So please, if you could comment on both of those things. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. And uh, I'm very honored to be here and uh, to have uh, such kind of uh, um, occasion, uh, chance to speak about uh, Japan's policy. And uh, on this occasion, first of all, a little bit about, I, I'd like to briefly explain about uh, Abenomics, a little bit about this. And uh, uh, as you know, uh, Abenomics aims to implement uh, uh, um, three-pronged strategy consisting of, of uh, our aggressive monetary policy and the flexible physical policy and uh, uh, growth strategy. And growth strategy is the most important and encourages uh, uh, private sector investment <coughs> and globalization. Uh, we, we promote the globalization, including a TPP, and uh, thereby intend to end the deflation and revitalize the Japanese economy. So um, you know, recently, Japanese stock market is, has shown some uh, fluctuation. Um, however, we are working on the growth strategy very hard, and uh, 
uh, which responds well to the uh, expectation of the, not only Japanese people, but also uh, all over the world and, and the market. And I believe the market will stabilize uh, soon. We are very confident. And the growth strategy uh, will come into effect next week. And, uh, uh, but uh, uh, some policies, including those which brought up difficult issues and not carried out before, have been decided and uh, implemented already. So one example is about the PFI. We have decided to open up the public infrastructure uh, dominated by the public sector to the private sector. Uh, we are currently de developing a, a new action plan uh, for the wider use of a PFI PPP scheme uh, by allowing a concession contract so that uh, uh, more private agents can participate in the construction and the operation of the public facilities, including uh, water, airports, and uh, sewage. Uh, uh, we have a plan to initiate uh, uh, this PFI uh, PPP project uh, worth a total of $120 billion within 10 years. And um, uh, secondly, widespread of, uh, use of uh, information technology is uh, commencing. A bill for national identification mm. number system uh, passed the uh, national diet uh, two weeks ago. We we'll use this system as a step toward uh, achieving top global ranking in e-government. And last but not least, global, uh, globalization uh, matters. Japan, uh, we uh, recently decided to participate in the TPP, as you mentioned, uh, Trans uh, Pacific Partnership negotiations as a part of its our, uh, uh, growth strategy. Uh, moreover, uh, um, we, uh, now we, uh, also Japan is now negotiating FTA with the EU and also uh, ASEAN countries and the China and uh, South Korea also. So um, we hope um, Japan will be the center of the uh, new framework of uh, free trade and investment uh, in the world. So, um, and uh, uh, that is not all. We'll improve uh, conditions for accessing a larger number of our high-skilled uh, uh, foreign workers to diversify our I mean, human resources in Japan. So uh, we are promoting our globalization uh, so quickly. Uh, and uh, um, two weeks ago, our Prime Minister Abe visited here um, and uh, with uh, four, about four or 40 uh, private companies, companies. Japanese pri pri yeah. uh, private companies, and made a call statement with their uh, president uh, to promote uh, our investment and uh, trade and also human exchange. That's correct. And uh, I hope we, um, the negotiation on the um, investment agreement will be reached very soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, through that, uh, I believe our, uh, our investment to your country will be promoted and their relationship with, uh, uh, between two countries will be promoted, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, steadily, right. yes. Thank you, thank you very, thank you very much. much. Indeed, uh, Japan's investment here, and as you mentioned, the growing uh, push for trade agreements with ASEAN countries will be a very important driver of ASEAN's growth as will, of course, ASEAN's regional uh, integration. I would like to turn to that, Mr. Uh, Shinohara, uh, from the International Monetary Fund. Um, you're an expert, of course, in trade and financial integration. Uh, with the ASEAN economic community mooted for the year 2015, uh, what do you see as the prospects for that in a context where a country like Myanmar also is coming into the equation? And the differential growth, differential GDP, per capita incomes within ASEAN could make it very difficult to actually uh, move forward with a comprehensive um, uh, ASEAN economic uh, community in that time frame. So if you could give some, your thoughts on the economic picture, that would be very helpful. Uh, okay. Uh, let me start my uh, discussion by describing a little bit about the changing trade pattern here in Asia. I mean, looking at the situation from, the, uh, from outside, uh, Asia is really a dynamic region. Asia has been the, the engine of uh, growth for the global economy for the past two decades. And the main factor behind that was the huge uh, trade integration uh, within the region. So trade linkages within Asia is very important, very important factor behind the growth uh, in this region. And of course, uh, for the past 10 years or so, it is the so-called sophisticated uh, supply chain uh, framework that has uh, uh, enhanced uh, the trade integration in this region with uh, China as the, you know, 
uh, export platform, other Asian countries exporting intermediate goods to China. But there are some uh, uh, changing patterns uh, in uh, trade, although slowly, but I think those are important changes. One is uh, the trade uh, integration in uh, ASEAN countries, especially in the area of final consumption goods. If you look at the numbers of uh, intraditional trade in, among ASEAN countries on final consumption goods, it is increasing both in absolute terms and in relative terms. So it is not just intermediate goods exposed to China, but it is the consumer goods trade within ASEAN countries that is increasing. I think that is a very good sign for this region as a sign of uh, resilience against external, uh, uh, potential external shocks. Second element, second uh, feature that we are noticing is the transition in China itself. China is trying to shift its economy from investment-driven economy to a more domestic demand-driven economy, more consumption-centered uh, growth. That means there should be more demand for final goods in China, and part of that final demand has to come to ASEAN countries. This will give an opportunity for ASEAN economies to export more final goods to China, not just intermediate goods, but final goods. Uh, to China. Uh, the percentage of China's imports of uh, uh, final goods is very small at this moment, and uh, it hasn't uh, moved much yet, but uh, I think there is a huge potential uh, looking at the situation from the ASEAN countries as the you know, uh, potential place for exports of final goods. So that is the second element. The third element is also related to China. Uh, we are all talking about increasing costs in China, labor costs, environmental costs, and some of the China-based companies are looking for opportunity, opportunities to relocate their base for production in other countries, in particular in ASEAN countries, especially in low-income ASEAN countries, like Myanmar, of course, Cambodia, Laos, PDL, and Bangladesh. Uh, it's not ASEAN, but... So, you know, I, talk, I just talked about three uh, elements. Right. But these are all, these all show that there is a dynamic change uh, in this region. And uh, there are discussions ongoing on, uh, say, on the uh, uh, economic uh, uh, community. The deadline is 2015. I think it's a very important move for ASEAN economies in order to fight against protectionism in order to maintain the spirit of trade, trade uh, liberalization, in order to maintain the benefits of uh, trade uh, uh, integration uh, in this region. There are, of course, huge challenges, as you mentioned, uh, such as uh, non-tariff barriers. To what extent they can deal with non-tariff barriers? There have been lots of developments on the tariff reduction, but non-tariff barrier, barriers, how to deal with that? The second issue is the trade disputes mechanism. It is already there, but I don't think it is functioning well, how to strengthen the trade disputes mechanism. The third is, as you mentioned, within ASEAN there is a gap in income, there is a gap in development, there is a gap in trade uh, development. So how do you deal with those gaps within ASEAN countries? There are people who are talking about two-tier approach in trade integration, not only in trade integration, but also in financial market integration as well. So there are lots of challenges ahead of them, but uh, this initiative is so important that they cannot fail. Okay, thank you very much. Generally, you're confident about uh, the, the ability of the ASEAN members to fight the protectionist tendencies towards 2015? I believe so, because it is for their own benefits. Uh, so Kishore, uh, Mr. Shinohara is actually refer to the economic foundations of ASEAN strength. And this should be ASEAN's moment as production does shift towards the region. You're working a lot intensively, your whole career, in fact, uh, on, on strengthening ASEAN. This, this really should be its moment to shine. What about the diplomatic underpinnings of ASEAN strength? Mm -hmm. And will Myanmar's rehabilitation and inclusion now fully in ASEAN mm -hmm. and, and even chairing ASEAN next year, um, is this a sign of a more unified, more vocal, uh, more, more um, uh, activist ASEAN diplomatic uh, entity. Well, I, I, I hope I, I, you don't mind if I suffocate everyone at good news. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, at this meeting, because um, I'm very bullish on ASEAN. I think as I mentioned to you, my next book will be on ASEAN, on non-ASEAN. And I was sort of explain why, in a sense, the next decade or two will be ASEAN's moment in world history. And I make three points. Firstly, if you want to try and understand why Myanmar is making such an amazingly smooth, peaceful transition from one kind of regime to another kind of regime, you can, of course, you, should, you have to give credit to the individual actors, and they deserve all the individual credit. But you also have to talk about the regional chemistry. And if you want to understand, for example, why Syria is in flames, and why Myanmar is not. It's because the regional chemistry around Syria is full of poisonous gases, mm -hmm. right? Whether it's Lebanon. You said you were going to regale us with good news. <laughs> but the good news about ASEAN. <laughs> oh, right, OK. And why this region has got no poisonous gases. Right. It took 42 years or more. Yeah. The ASEAN is actually now 46 years old mm -hmm. of hard work among the ASEAN countries to completely change the regional chemistry. And the fact that we have succeeded in doing this explains why Myanmar can emerge so peacefully and easily. So that's one reason. The second reason is that actually there will be heightened geopolitical competition in Southeast Asia. Now, if it is uncontrolled geopolitical competition, let's say between US and China, or China and Japan, or China and India, then the region is in trouble. But I think what we can confidently predict is that there will be control geopolitical competition. And that's the best outcome for ASEAN. And if you, you look, for example, what's going to happen tomorrow at the meeting between Obama and Xi Jinping. And I, even though I do not know what the agenda is, I do not know what the results are going to be, I am very confident that the outcome will be more positive than negative. And that's a sign of how things are changing. But there will be competition. And it, fortunately for ASEAN, it is a valuable geopolitical asset. So China is interested in it. United States is interested in it. Japan is interested in it. India is interested in it. And if you know, in the Cold War, one reason why the ASEAN countries did so well is because the United States and Japan work very hard to support ASEAN. So in the same way now, the kind of agreements that will be reached with ASEAN, the kind of reaching out to ASEAN, will help ASEAN a great deal in the next 10 to 20 years. And the third and final point, to, in a sense to build on what Mr. Shinohara was saying, you know, as a result of having developing at a steady pace over several decades, they have now reached a critical, what you might call an inflection point, whereby today, it, at the stage of ASEAN's development, for every 10% increase in GNP, you get a doubling of the middle class. And that's why for all of Asia, I made the prediction in the book, The Great Convergence, that the, to, today the total size of the Asian middle class on all of Asia, from South Asia to West, East, East Asia, is roughly about 500 million people. But by 2020, which is only seven years from now, the number is going to explode from 500 million to 1.75 billion, an increase of three and a half times in seven years. So if you're looking for markets, if you're looking for new consumers, where do you come to? You come to this region. And so ASEAN is going to be at this epicenter of this tremendous economic growth, and therefore it's going to be a golden moment for ASEAN in the next 10, 20 years. Let me follow up on your references to the United States, because in the past there's been a view that the US was in decline, was becoming irrelevant in Asia, and, but now you've said that the U.S. and Japan, as they did during the Cold War, are going to be key drivers, actually, mm. of fueling this uh, mm. stability in the region. Do you feel that America's pivot to Asia, rebalancing to, mm. towards Asia, mm. is going to help to buttress the stability, or could it be destabilizing and add to confusion? Well, if, if it led to uncontrolled competition, right. I mean, for example, if it led to, I'll give you a simple example, if it led to a naval arms race, more naval encounters within Chinese and American navies, that would be a disaster for the region. But if it's a, if it's a competition where, they say, where China says, OK, I want to enhance the FTA I've signed with ASEAN and make it even bigger. And you know, the, the, growth, the growth in trade within China and ASEAN 
is explosive. In 1991, if I remember correctly, the trade within China and ASEAN was roughly $8 billion only. Last year, it was $400 billion, an increase of 50 times in 20 years. Now, imagine extrapolating that into the future. If China says, OK, I want to make it an even higher quality FDA and increase the interaction within China and ASEAN, you get more benefits from here. And if the United States does that, if Japan does that, and others do it, then clearly there'll be tremendous economic opportunities. And at the end of the day, I mean, I must emphasize, there are always risks, mm -hmm. OK? The risks are there. But if you balance the risks and the opportunities, uh, the opportunities are far greater than the risks. I'm going to ask the members of our audience to think about what they think the biggest risks and, and, and challenges and, uh, and, uh, and uh, scenarios are for what might destabilize some of the positive uh, uh, sentiment that's been expressed so far. But let me first uh, turn to Professor Zha Daojing. In the past, when people have talked about this Asian century, they may have either intentionally or unintentionally conflated with the Chinese century. Today, of course, in a, we're in a very different environment. There is a tremendous amount of tension uh, with China. And in fact, in, in the past, where I've written about uh, Myanmar 10 years ago as a client state of China, today in, in Beijing, as you know, there's a prominent question being asked, who lost Myanmar? So can you, I hate, <laughs> wanted to be too, but, uh, and this question has been directed at you before. So please, can you comment on how, if this is going to be ASEAN's moment, uh, if this is a time when the U.S. is back in the region, where your relations with neighbors, both maritime and, and territorial, are strained, how is China going to be? Uh, how is China going to redefine its relations with its neighbors, with Myanmar as well? And uh, what is its role going to be in this Asian century? Uh, <coughs> to answer your first, <coughs> to answer your f first question, who it, lost Myanmar? It was not me. <laughs> 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 Good, now we established that. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'm a scholar. Um, the, the nature of our country's relationship to Myanmar is very different from that between Myanmar and Japan, or the United States, or even Singapore, other ASEAN countries. We are neighbors. We are linked by land. So for that, Myanmar matters to China first and foremost. In, its capacity to maintain domestic stability and to pursue development. And more pointedly, we need a peaceful border between the two countries. And when there are incidents, those incidents must be handled amicably. And if you look at the past 10 to 20 years, you know, Chinese, the Chinese government consistently called for an end to Western sanctions against Myanmar. So the West finally listened to you. <laughs> they listened to us. Okay, not me. <laughs> okay. Um, so I would say the who lost the Myanmar question is largely rhetorical. And uh, but what's more pertinent as we speak from this point on is how we uh, pursue tangible projects that integrate the Myanmarese economy into the rest of the region. If you recall, just Barely two weeks ago, uh, Prime Minister Li Keqiang was visiting India. He talked about you know, a Chinese interest to uh, pursue this idea of an economic corridor linking northeastern India, Myanmar, Bangladesh, and southern China. These are the sort of things we hope IMF and World Bank, with ADB and others, would fund. Uh, so uh, the lot more work needs to be done. and. Uh, it's a good time to pursue development. But with regard to the, your reference to Chinese century, I do suppose uh, within the region, and including Myanmar itself, there is a good deal of apprehension about a return to a tributary system that was practiced under the dynasties uh, of China. We are acutely aware of that. And uh, how do you work on that? So there is no better way than keeping the, the means of communication open and uh, pursue uh, interactions with goods, not guns, of course, mm -hmm. whether you know tanks or uh, ships or missiles, and then with human interactions. Do you uh, worry about ASEAN coalescing around a tougher position 
vis-a-vis -vis China on issues such as damming of the Mekong River and so forth? Damming what Mekong River? Dams being built along the Mekong, or, or you mentioned also, of course, the analogy to the tributary model of China's historical relations with the actual physical uh, damming of uh, Upper Mekong uh, River and its oh, impact on see, yes. Southeast Asian countries. Yeah, I was, in, uh, I was in Laos barely a month ago, specifically looking at uh, corporate social responsibility by Chinese hydro companies mm -hmm. working on some of the dam projects. You know, I also intimately familiar with the Mitong Dam controversy in this country. Right. Um, dams are not universally bad. A dam has four basic functions flood control, irrigation, and in the case of Mekong, you regulate the flow, stabilize the flow, especially during the dry season, of course, electricity, and then fisheries. Let's not forget, you build a dam, you can raise fish in the reservoir as well. So the main mechanism that's in place in the Mekong system is the uh, Mekong River Commission, although its authority probably ought to be a little expanded beyond the uh, mainstream and into some of the tributaries. Its advice, technical advice, deserves a better hearing by different governments. And we need to work on two things. One is management of the dams in place. Second, we need to work on um, a learning from the past in a technical way uh, of trying to strike a greater balance between you know, using dams purely for economic growth, for energy, and simultaneously taking better care of both the ecology and the people who are affected by the dam construction. Thank you. I want to make sure that we take as many questions as possible from the audience in the time that we have left. So please do raise your hands if you'd like to uh, have the microphone brought over to you. Uh, gentleman right over here, please. <coughs> If you could identify yourself as well before asking your question. Thank you. Yeah, I think so. Hello. Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. My name is Mike Davis. I work for Global Witness. We're an organization based in London that does research and analysis on natural resource management around the world. Uh, Myanmar is a country which is hugely rich in natural resources, it's often said, but it's worth reiterating. But since the time of the British colonial era onwards, the exploitation of the natural resources has always been predatory, with the benefits going to a very few and not the many. So in the context of this increased uh, competition, both political and economic, which we're discussing here, do the panelists think that the various countries involved in ASEAN, China, United States, Europe, can show the vision and the responsibility towards the people of Myanmar to ensure that that competition results in a, in a race to the top in terms of high standards of business engagement, benefits the population, rather than is, as often feared, a race to the bottom. Is it possible for the different competing powers, and we must be very frank about the fact that they're competing, can work together and with the government of Myanmar to come up with some basic rules of engagement to ensure that the, the people of this country benefit from that, in, that interest and that competition? Excellent question. Let me ask uh, Minister Utan Kyao if you might uh, Take a, take a crack at that question. Can you engender a race to the top in the management of the rich natural resources of this country given the uh, enormous number of outside interests that are coming in very quickly into those sectors? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, Myanmar have a difficult time that we have to use our resources that uh, we need to, because there's no other uh, lifeline to support. So we have to, you know, make, engage with the uh, many countries to sell, you know, some of the, our products. But frankly admit, during our socialist regime, they are the one who preserve a lot of our national resources. We never sell out, you know, our teak wood in a park. We never, you know, let uncontrolled mining in our country. So these are the things that we have a good practices, we have a good norms, but due to the uh, pressure a lot given to us, to some extent, you know, we have to make concessions. This is no doubt, we don't hide. For that, the environment was to some extent damaged. We have 
losing our natural forest forests. We have, uh, you know, some minings. We have to give concession. But the government, those days, try their best to control because these things must be really benefit for you know, the country, for the survival. That we have to admit that for the survival, we have to do many means. This is, this is the, uh, 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 you know, uh, the thing that we had done. We know that the environment is very valuable, very precious. We need to control these uh, 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 resources. So when the new governments come in, right away, we have a new way of approach on related to the national resources. The tick locks are not sell out uh, to, to internet, you know, internationally. You have to come in, you know, check the forest. There will be a reforestation. And when regarding with the dams, uh, regarding with the uh, mines, these days we need to bring in, you know, more proper approach. <clears throat> Frankly, admit there are a lot of reservations for social impact to recover it, and there are new laws coming up. And I'm sure that uh, uh, Myanmar will be as far as like you know normal countries in right now these days. Mm -hmm. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, make a uh, comment. Please, yes, Mr. Uh, sorry, I, I'd like to speak in Japanese, so okay. please put uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> channel, channel three. Okay, okay. Ready, ready, okay. Ano, otashi, ano, o, 国際的なそういう、あの、国際的に開かれたシステムで入札の仕組みを作っていただきたいと。その時にご指摘のあった環境保全とか技術の移転とかそうしたものも含めたあの Thank you very much for that uh, comment. Let me turn uh, back to the audience, please, for some questions. Uh, gentleman right here. Thank you. I'm Van Red Chiang from the Cambodian Institute for Cooperation and Peace and uh, uh, Young Global Leaders of the World Economic Forum. Uh, my question is regarding the, the risk. It seems that uh, strategic trust, one of the key risks, strategic trust and confidence. And um, you can see the several uh, incidents at seas vis-a-vis -vis in the East and South China seas. So I would like to hear the opinion and perspective from the panelists here is how to strengthen that strategic trust um, and enhance the mani conflict uh, management and resolution in the East and South China Sea. Thank you. Excellent question. It is very important for us to uh, not posit an Asian century without dealing with the very difficult uh, confrontations that are taking place in the South China Sea and the East China Sea. I'm going to ask uh, first a short comment on this and uh, Professor Zhao Daojing and other panelists as well. Well, I mean, uh, that, 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 that's the reason why I mentioned uh, risks. When th there will be challenges. And mm -hmm. clearly, if you watch uh, what's happening between, let's say, Japan and Korea, over the islands uh, within Japan and China, and certainly in the South uh, China Sea, these are some of the risks that are going to be there. And 
none of these will be solved quickly or immediately. I mean, like that much I guarantee you. Mm -hmm. The question is not about trying to find a solution. The question is about managing these issues. And if you can, if all the parties can agree, I mean, you take, for example, the Japan-China case, huh? that, okay, as Deng Xiaoping said, we cannot solve this now. Our generation is not wise enough. Let's put it off the shelf and let future generations solve it. Mm -hmm. That's one way <laughs> of, of, of managing it. And the same thing Normally in the case... Normally pushing things off to future generations isn't considered wise, <coughs> but well, I'll leave aside that contradiction. Well, I, I, I think there's a, there's, a lot, <laughs> there's a lot of wisdom in it because surprisingly, over time, countries realize the absolute stupidity of yes. going to war over little pieces of rock in the sea. Yeah. And if you want an example of how countries reach that wisdom, I mean, look, quite amazingly... Uh, if you look at Southeast Asia, Singapore and Malaysia had a problem over Petra Branca. We referred it to the World Court. Yeah. Indonesia had a problem over Sipatan Ligatan. They referred it to the World Court. And I think the present generation clearly can't do that yet, but I think the future generations may be able to refer it uh, to the World Court. So there are, there are openings out there. So, and, and this is why, for, for all these issues, uh, it's all a question of managing it. And this is basically the biggest contribution that ASEAN is making. Because the, what ASEAN does each year is that it creates at least two or three or four opportunities for the leaders to meet and talk to each other. I mean, in the, in the late 1990s, when Japan and China, the leaders had difficulty meeting, where did they meet? At an ASEAN plus three meeting. Right. So the ASEAN plus three format enabled China and Japan uh, to meet and so on and so forth. So, I, I believe that there, there are these risks, but I think that, that they can be managed. And I'm, if, if you ask me to take a bet, and I'm a betting man, I say there'll be no wars over these issues. Mm -hmm. Let's get a Chinese perspective on this, because if we do think about the next generation uh, uh, having to manage this issue of the island disputes, that will be in a context where China is presumably even stronger than it is today. Is that going to shape uh, the outcome of this issue? I don't know what the future <laughs> is going to be. Um, what uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Kishore Mabvani said, I think uh, strike the right note. The key word here is management, not resolution. And in terms of uh, handling naval and other larger military affairs, this is what I tell my audience back in Beijing, including sometimes government officials, it's very critical to remind two no's. One is no firing of first shot. Because there is a moral something there that's going to come back to haunt you whenever you have these disputes incidents. Second is, uh, I believe it comes to a time, especially for uh, our country, China. We need to remember a second no, that is to say, no overburdening ourselves with excessive spending on the military, on the military budget. There has to be some limits. But we have to be patient with this matter. Uh, it's what you call information age. You have what's called civil society in different countries, in China, in Burma, sorry, Myanmar, and many other countries. <laughs> uh, I see you're a friend of Aung San Suu Kyi, huh? <laughs> you do have civil society, you know, the, the, the f making of diplomacy, the conduct and the consumption of diplomacy has fundamentally been transformed. Uh, earlier you asked this question, who lost Myanmar or who lost what other country? The old paradigm we use, we inherit from college textbooks of thinking, okay, this particular initiative from that powerful country has prevailed or that particular initiative from that smaller country has not, and you try to calculate a win or loss along those lines. Earlier he mentioned, you know, um, the Middle East. You ask some sensible Americans, has America won? I'm not trying to, to divert the discussion. So we must remember those things, in China especially, because we have neighbors. You don't try to prevail over your neighbors 
by sheer force. Manage it. Be patient. I want to uh, bring in Mr. Nishimuri on this question yes, because so I, I imagine his perspective might be quite different on uh, uh, quite different on this issue of how urgent uh, the resolution is. And this is also a very sensitive issue. So let me speak in Japanese. Certainly, and so please. <laughs> We don't want anything to get lost in translation, do we? Ready? Okay. China is coming to fight for the world. Do you understand Japanese also? It's okay. It's okay. We are a partner, and please, as a country, as a society, we want to take care of our responsibility with each other. I think it's important. 一方でその力による力を背景としたこの現状変更の動きに対しては我々は断固としてこれは反対しますしこれはあのそれぞれの国は領土を守るという観点からこれはもう毅然として対応するまあ一方で冷静に対応しなきゃいけないということだと思いますで日中関係で言えば安倍総理の第一期政権の時に戦略的互恵関係というのを打ち出しましたので、え。ー未来志向でウィンウィンの環境を作っていこうというのが安倍総理のこれはものすごい強い意志でもありますですから我々ぜひこの原点にも立ち戻ってですね信頼関係をもう一度醸成していくそういう対話をこれ粘り強くやっていくべきだと思いますし我々は常にオープンにします私も機会あればぜひあの経済政策を担当してますのであの中国北京に行ってですねぜひ意見交換もしたいと思いますしまたこのワールドエコノミックフォーラムも大連で開かれるですからまたそんな機会もぜひ生かしたいと思います。終わりました。Thank you for that comment, and、uh, I think it echoes something that Kishore has been writing for a long time that the economic integration in this region is, is go going to be one of the important factors that will help to mitigate the geopolitical tension. We do have time for more questions, and I do want to get in more, so I'm going to turn right here to、uh, Adam Schwartz in the front row.、Uh, microphone, please, over here in the front. It's coming right here. Um, uh, Park, thanks very much. I'm、uh, Adam Schwarz with Asia Group,、uh, based in Singapore,、um, and I would、uh, I'd like to ask the panel, perhaps、uh, Professor Mavani and、uh, uh, Professor Dajong, in, in particular,、uh, to go back to the question of the TPP,、uh, and I'd be interested in your thoughts to how you kind of pull apart the economic and the political aspects of that trade agreement. So, on, on the economic side.、Um, A lot of people sort of hold up the TPP as a, as a next generation or very or higher quality、uh, free trade agreement、uh, that will be、uh, helpful in, in or being a catalyst to, to deeper integration through the region and, and therefore as, as, as a boost to growth、um, and, and not at a higher level but also at a more sustainable level.、Um, on the other side, there is on, the, you know, on a more political side a number of concerns about it. Uh, which tend to boil, you know, go down to two. One, one is that it is going to be displacing other, other trade talks, other trade agreements, whether it's the RCEP or the East Asian、uh, Economic Agreement.、Um, more importantly, some see it in a more, you know, in a, in a, in a geopolitical sense, almost as, as, as a proxy for for a U.S.-China、uh, competition or、um, uh, some something other than cooperation in in, in the region.、Um, and to some extent, in that in that school of thought. Uh, ASEAN is a little bit stuck in the middle. Some ASEAN members are are, are party to the TPP, and and, and some are not.、Um, I'd be interested to see whether you see、um, th those those sort of strains going in a, in a continuing a competition, or whether you see convergence, or whether you're worried that the politics undermining the economic benefits that that one hopes comes from it. Thank you. So TPP, good trade agreement with negative、uh, geopolitical ramifications, or how should we see it? Let's、uh, maybe very very quick answers, though, please. Sure.、Uh, yeah. uh, very 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 quickly, I I'm actually very happy that there is geopolitical competition in trade liberalisation, because as you know, the United States is pushing the TPP process, and China is pushing RCEP, Regional Cooperation Economic Partnership, if I'm not mistaken. And for both of them to say, "Hey, come join my trade liberalisation game," at the end of the day, I think is win-win, because when you have economic liberalisation, the record shows that the economies grow, trade grows, and everybody、uh, benefits. And if you just go back and remember, when Zhu Rongji was premier, and when he went to Washington D.C., as you know, he was disappointed that he couldn't reach a deal with Bill Clinton on China's admission to WTO. And 
at the end of the day, when the process was completed, when the United States set a very high bar for China's entry into WTO, the biggest beneficiary at the end of the day proved to be China. As you know, China's trade exploded after it joined WTO. It went up like that. So the high bar that was set for China was a benefit to China. So the TPP process sets a high bar and pushes all the countries over the high bar. And by the way, there's some in recent indications that even China may be interested in the TPP process. And if China decides to jump over the high bar, that's actually good for the region. The only question is, if Chinese accept that high bar, will the US Congress ratify the TPP? <laughs> <laughs> well said. Uh, we have talked about the TPP in abstraction. So far, we don't know what, you know, after different rounds, what the text of the temporary, this current version, ongoing version of the TPP text looks like. So people tend to either romanticize or demonize the DP, TPP. As a geostrategic, geo geoeconomic topic, at least for me as a scholar, this is the second WTO for China. We should accept it. Tough issues like labor standards, issues like state ownership, domestic liberalization, that's precisely what China needs. There has been some, uh, uh, I don't want, if we start to go through the history of the negotiation, then it inevitably leads to finger pointing. I would think, uh, as he said, our Ministry of Commerce just indicated barely a week ago saying they are seriously studying the prospect and they are talking to uh, all the negotiating members. So don't rule out, we may join. But the more uh, pertinent point here, I do believe, is uh, what does any of these trade uh, agreements do in terms of you know, working on, TPP is what's called beyond the border liberalization. But here in this part of the world, we still need to work harder between China and ASEAN economies and the China, Japan, Korea of the at border, technical standards, customs, procedures. Uh, those things here in this part of the world, we all need to elevate ourselves to a higher level of uh, what in some economists sell as seamless interconnection. That's part of the ASEAN economic community. Let me uh, ask, did you want to comment on this, yes, Mr. Shumari, very quickly, I believe, please? Yes, I believe uh, TPP is a, a kind of a base or a platform for um, FTAP, uh, I mean, free trade uh, framework in the APEC. And also, uh, we are, Japan is negotiating with China and Korea about the free trade, right. uh, free trade framework. And also, the ASEAN Plus 10 is uh, negotiating. So. I believe the TPP is a kind of base. And also, uh, we are, Japan is not an uh, uh, official member of the TPP yet, but uh, I believe uh, uh, all members uh, will welcome if uh, China decides to uh, join to If TPP. China, if, if, probably. But, uh, I but, think uh, hard, but uh, the hardware, is, uh, though the hardware is very high, so. I think anyway. the key is uh, the terms of getting into the negotiations, whether it's what's called accession, was in, in negotiation, especially whether or not China will be allowed to uh, leave some of these so-called uh, sensitive areas of away, yeah, I mean, off the limits. What do you but say? TP is not not uh, intend to uh, intend does not intend to the kind of block, so not the exclusive uh, uh, framework. That's right. So yeah, maybe we'll come. I'm going to okay. take two questions together now: one over here and one over here. Uh, please, a uh, microphone to this gentleman, please. Yes, my name is Kuang Wing. I'm Young Global Leader of the World Economic Forum. Thank you very much for facilitating this paragraph. My question is, um, today as all of us can see, we see a completely different trajectory coming from Myanmar that has changed the world. Partners are coming in. We see Japan, we see China coming in the picture very quickly, steadily and efficiently. My question is to both um, to the representatives from China and Japan is that you, do you think there would be ever a possibility that could be a strategic alliance in the economic and social development sense that could create a game changer in this aspect? Thank you. Great. And uh, here in the front row, please. Uh, 
Oh, he's in Ken, China and Japan. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Christian Mandel. I'm a young global leader uh, living in Paris, in France. And um, I would have a question about, um, we talk only about the relationship between Asia and the uh, United States. Um, so what about Europe? And is there, are there, any, are there any parallels between uh, the experience of the European Union and uh, ASEAN? I have three questions or ideas. The first one is the European Union uh, started after the war uh, dealing with coal and steel. Is there anything similar that could be put in common in, in Asia? Second, um, the European Union lasts so long because there are institutions. Are there any ideas of creating institutions that would go beyond the simple um, trade agreements? And third, um, in Europe, there's, uh, there are regional transfers uh, between richer and poorer countries, solidarity. Um, are there any also similar ideas or projects here? Thank you. Right. Very good questions. Uh, let me add a third in from over here, please. So my name is Vijay Balan. I'm from Hewlett Packard, the computer company. So we're talking about uh, Myanmar, which is formerly Burma, a country which is not like 10, 20 years old. We're talking of a 13,000 year old history. So it's like, and then you've got this whole t situation today where you have the multiple powers coming in trying to influence the whole country. And there was an interesting question which is saying who lost Myanmar? Now, if you turn it around and just look at it and say, so what has Myanmar lost? Or, or risk losing <coughs> as if they are going through this in terms of their culture, uh, in terms of their identity. Uh, do they actually stand a risk of losing that as they go forward? Or is this something that is just a fear which could be unwarranted? So mm -hmm. that's my thought. Thank you. I'll ask the minister, of course, to comment on the third question about whether Myanmar fears losing its identity. Uh, the other two questions about can there be a strategic uh, partnership in a way to, uh, to ensure the sustainable uh, development of Myanmar. I think that's for any of the, um, of the representatives of countries investing here. And then a question about the, the model of the European Union. And we can actually add on top of that the question of Europe's role in, uh, in, uh, in helping to, uh, to um, elevate uh, Myanmar's development and regional uh, integration. Uh, who would like to go first? Probably the minister, um, please. Okay, uh, I will, I'm going to um, go on this. Uh, first, that China lost Myanmar or not? <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, frankly admit, uh, Myanmar, as I explained to you, we had uh, long years in United Nations. We were we faced with two resolutions in the third committee as well as in the Human Rights Council. Those years, we had hard time. We worked closely with the, uh, our, as I explained, neighboring countries. These years, China was the one who encouraged Myanmar that Myanmar should engage with the Western world. So, you know, China wins in that case. What he says to us, you know, we engage with the, the, the Western world. So that means, you know, no one lost Myanmar. It's equal. There's a fair, you know, uh, uh, um, like competition, you know, these days. We open up, we, we, we give the ground for everyone, not only China, but also, you know, in, in uh, the, the countries like Europe. So there is no one, you know, uh, 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 lost uh, regarding with Myanmar. And Myanmar, you says, uh, that says that uh, 3,000 years old uh, a culture and history. And um, because of nowadays, uh, multi-powers come in and, you know, our culture, our social relations can have some sort of, you know, touch or not. Yes, we know that last three years, the way Myanmar people, you know, less wearing, you know, sarongs. You know, this is the first thing that we are, we are seeing. The new generation is wearing pants and skirts. So to some extent, you know, we are more modernized, you know. So we see that we have to embrace it, you know, properly of the culture touch because we are bringing in more foreigners, more companies, more institutions. 
Myanmar is more wiser than before. I'm sure that a lot of countries like Myanmar has grown up. So we have to go face of some of the things, but I'm sure that Myanmar will keep go along with whatever we have. We will try to keep to reserve our social system, our culture, you know, deeply rooted in, in our people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shinohara, can I ask you to come in on the question of actually about uh, regional integration? If you could talk about also the uh, efforts around the ASEAN Monetary Fund and, and associated uh, measures that have been in place or discussed since the Chiang Mai agreements in the late 1990s. We're now 15 years uh, beyond that. And, uh, I think a lot of people would be curious to know to what extent we have the, um, the financial architectures in place that will strengthen uh, ASEAN's regional development. Okay. Uh I'll respond to that uh, and uh, also to the question raised uh, on the floor. I mean, l let me first talk about the difference between Europe and Asia. Uh, European integration started with a strong political will. There was a strong political will for integration in Europe. It was not necessarily the economic integration, but it was the political integration as well as economic integration. In Asia, what has happened is the market force. That has, that has driven the economic integration in this region. So it is the economic interests, economic benefits that the people felt that was the driving force of the economic integration. So that makes me feel optimistic in uh, managing the issues such as the territorial disputes because in everybody in his minds, economic interest comes first and that is the best way to solve uh, territorial disputes. I mean. We, can, we may not be able to solve or manage uh, those risks. Uh, I think what is going on in this region is not just trade integration, but also uh, we have set up, uh, as you say, a uh, safety net, a regional safety net, so-called the Chenma Initiative. And two years ago, we have uh, the, the ASEAN countries have set up a so-called regional surveillance office in uh, Singapore. So it is not just uh, the trade integration. Uh, financial integration is also uh, in progress and there are uh, exercises uh, going on to uh, work on the macroeconomic surveillance, macroeconomic policy coordination, uh, strengthening the financial safety net within the region. If I may come in on this, we had a question come in from Facebook just before the session and the question was whether or not Abenomics is going to affect uh, this pattern of, of regional monetary integration or could it be destabilizing? Do you have any uh, immediate thoughts on that? It is too early to talk about that. I mean, Abenomics has just started. Uh, I mean, market has become a little bit volatile. It takes time for the market to absorb all the you know, initiatives taken by uh, uh, the current administration. It's a very bold initiative, bold uh, experiment. So uh, I think it is a little bit too premature right. to uh, reach any conclusion. Let me ask Zha uh, can you come in on this question about whether China can sort of rebrand itself as a strategic partner of uh, you know, Myanmar's development along the lines of the higher standards that are now expected of foreign investors uh, in, uh, in Myanmar today? Well, <clears throat> people tend to forget 1988 was the year when the border trade between China and Myanmar was formally opened and allowed. In other words, from 1940s to 1980s, there was no official economic contact between these two countries. Sometimes we, especially to, to the young leaders, we sometimes talk about these since by looking at where Hillary Clinton travels and think that's the beginning of Myanmar and the rest <laughs> of the world and starts to ask about China. Um, let me be very blunt. The, we have many problems in these countries, our companies. You have to look at the capacity of these companies, both in terms of engineering, in terms of management. Um, I don't quite see any many Chinese companies other than Huawei. Huawei is probably paying for some of the functions, it's not speaking up. Including the individuals whose uh, language and the cultural capacity to engage. Uh, Myanmar has a uh, advantage, structurally speaking, than China. We pursued the process of polluting first, 
and clean up later. But at this moment, with the uh, assistance of opening up the discipline that's urged on the government by NGOs and what else, it's a good opportunity for our Chinese companies to learn and uh, to play by the new rules. Uh, it's just not right to continue, you know, to repeat the China's mistake overseas. But uh, touching a little bit upon the question of China and Japan, uh, we are already collaborating with each other. The, you know, you have Japanese uh, investing in uh, industrial zones along the coastal regions. Uh, by nature, Chinese investments are more concentrated along the border regions. That does not necessarily rule out other prospects. But there is a key point here, that is, even for China, which a country that has large masses of cheap labor, you know, we opened up in the 1970s, up until 1994, over 60% of the total amount of Chinese export came from exporting raw resources. We exported coal, oil to Japan, we exported minerals, we, even when the country was uh, full of, uh, was suffering from food shortage, we exported rice, soybeans. If you look at the China-Japan long-term trade agreement, written into that was a Chinese guarantee to sell some tonnage of soybeans to Japan in exchange for uh, uh, technology investment and what else. What I'm trying to say is that there is a concerns about resource cur curse concerns about the uh, bringing the wealth you know, from exporting resources to the poor and the needy, those are all there. So you have, some, you have to somehow, theoretically, we're all struggling to strike that right balance between equality and scale of in economic growth. And uh, here in this country, you have a good chance not to repeat China's mistake. But I would, is this necessary? Maybe. OK, this is a scholar, not a diplomat. Right, I know. So it would be not to Melma's advantage to take that equality to that kind of extreme, as in everything is preconditioned upon a theoretical <laughs> definition of equality. The process of development in any country is never smooth. Uh, Mr. Nishimura wants to make a very quick intervention, yes, yes. please. Uh, but the EU. In so okay. we've just started the uh, free trade uh, negotiation with the EU, and the EU also, uh, will also start a uh, uh, negotiation uh, with the US. So EU and the TPP countries, including Japan and US, will make a new uh, rule about, uh, on the uh, investment, or trade, and uh, uh, etc. So I, I believe EU is, uh, uh, will play a big role in this uh, uh, making of new rule and framework, trade framework. And uh, EU is a good model for uh, Asian integration, but uh, we have to check uh, uh, carefully about the merit and demerit of uh, integration of uh, currency. That's a big point, I believe, yeah. Thank you. We have time for exactly one more question uh, and allowing for each of our speakers to give a, a final closing thought as they answer that question. Would anyone like to volunteer uh, in the back? I, uh, I'm not sure if this is on. Um, I'm Corey Payne uh, from Sydney, Australia, Global Shaper. I was just wondering if Australia plays a role at all in the Asian development integration because I've been to a number of meetings <laughs> and I haven't heard much about Australia. And it's, Asia's our biggest trade partner <laughs> right? and our future. It's a great question. I'm glad that, uh, that you brought up <laughs> Australia. And, and India you has been Android. mentioned precisely twice in the last <laughs> one hour. <laughs> Even though uh, this country is, of course, uh, located between China and India, as, as the wonderful book title suggests. Um, so let's uh, have a closing round of comments, and each of you talk about Australia, uh, India, and any final thoughts you have about uh, Myanmar and its integration in the region. Let's go in, uh, in reverse order, perhaps, uh, Professor uh, Xia Taoxing. Uh, obviously, I'm learning uh, about Myanmar. It's my very first trip to the forum. Thanks to the forum for inviting me. I th at the end of the day, I think integration boils down to human capacity. In this regard, Myanmar has an advantage even in regard, in comparison with China, going back to the 1980s. Um, Myanmar has been, inter you know, interacting with the West, with Southeast Asia 
Palangre, uh, as I go around, there are so many more Myanmarese officials and businessmen who are so fluent in English and they talk about their many Chinese counterparts I meet. So it's a, a place with great opportunity and uh, it's a place whereby that offers a, uh, I wouldn't use opportunity, I think it offers an attraction for investors and governments to come in and then we're all part of, we, we, we meaning the those parties outside Myanmar, in China included, need to be aware that at the end of the day, Myanmar is the Myanmarese Myanmar. We need to let the Myanmarese people and government take its own initiative. It's a good place, but it's not some sort of test ground for us to see if we can push right. our perceived model of what's good for this country. Good. At the end of the day, Myanmar has to take initiatives, and then we try to see how we fit in. Okay, sure. Very, brief, very brief. quickly, uh, I'll just make a point about the European Union and then Australia. Oh, you know? Australia. Of course it matters. <laughs> <laughs> Australia. <laughs> uh, on on, on the European Union, very quickly, I would say the European Union is very use useful to Asia because the European Union has established a gold standard for regional cooperation because mm -hmm. in European Union, you don't just have zero wars, you have zero prospect of war. Right. In ASEAN today, you have zero wars, but not yet zero prospect of war. So this is something that ASEAN can learn from EU. But at the same time, I think the time has come for the EU to stop being condescending towards ASEAN and Asia and accept ASEAN as an equal partner. That I know because I've been working in, on Europe-Asia relations for 20, 30 years, there's a culture of condescension which has to disappear. And the same, to some extent, is partially true of Australia because Australia, in a sense, its, its body is in Asia, but its heart is in the West. <laughs> all right, all so right. So I, I think Australia, 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 Australia has Australia. got to make this very <laughs> painful decision can it move its heart to where its body is? <laughs> Good point, uh, Mr. Shinohara. <laughs> just a poor kid. Can I, can I take advantage of this opportunity to talk about a little bit about IMF and Myanmar? Just very, very brief. Very brief. Uh, we have been working with the Myanmar Authority uh, for the past few years uh, in a very collaborative way. Uh, we have agreed uh, with Myanmar authorities late last year to work on a common framework for uh, sound macroeconomic management and uh, there is a program jointly monitored by the Ma Myanmar authorities and IMF on how to develop uh, the framework for the macroeconomic management. Right now, we are, the, the program is, uh, is uh, going on very well. Uh, we are discussing with the authorities to provide more technical assistance, capacity building activities uh, in the area, in the area of uh, central bank management, uh, fiscal policy, and things like that. I hope that uh, our uh, contribution would help uh, uh, support, uh, you know, uh, solidifying the base of this economy. Thank you. Uh, Minister Nishimura, short comment. Oh, Australia is a very important country for Asia uh, <laughs> because of not only the uh, uh, natural resources rich country, but also uh, your commitment to a big role to the uh, Asian Pacific uh, uh, peace, peace making. And uh, also yes. India, uh, I. I believe that US, uh, Japan is now uh, uh, becoming a driving force yeah. for uh, Asian de development in, I mean, economy. economy. And uh, India also, as well as uh, China, uh, will uh, recover the uh, economy and make a, uh, economic reform. Uh, and also become, uh, I hope, uh, India will become a, a driving force for uh, Asia. Wonderful. Yes. And Different a final words. word, of course, to Minister um, Atan Chao, please. Okay, thank you. Um, if you look in the uh, world map, or in the uh, map of Asia, Myanmar, uh, you will see Myanmar in a very strategic position because with this uh, position, we can use a lot. Myanmar could connect with India, ASEAN, and from Myanmar could connect with India and China as well that, you know, you know we can connect with the, like Australia as well. You know, this is a, 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 a kind of, uh, you know, a, a new, uh, way that we will shape, you know, the region. 
Denmark will be the best place for you know, everyone to come and walk. Thank you. I think you would all agree, uh, <laughs> members of the audience, that our panelists have provided us some wonderful insight into what uh, a very different kind of Asian century is going to look like than the one uh, that we envisioned perhaps before. But it's certainly, uh, we've had some very uh, cautious uh, optimism, even a celebration, actually, of that. So I want to thank our panelists. Please join me in a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks to all of you for being here. Thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.